I want to speak on the topic of paying tithe or the church receiving tithe. What I find to be quite interesting is since Creflo Dollar came out and made his confession, keep in mind he was not speaking for all clergy. He was not speaking for all churches. He was only speaking for himself. I don't recall now one church where the pastor would use a fear tactic to receive tithe. The church don't have to do that. And if there was a pastor that used fear tactics and making people feel guilty for not paying tithe, there's very few. And this person, I don't believe, was called or unctioned by God. The Bible says you would know them by the fruit they bear. So if you have a mega church, if you have these churches that believe in the prosperity gospel, these are the churches that are more prone to use fear tactics and making people feel guilty for not paying tithe. So now, Creflo Dollar has a conscience while still taking advantage of the people, still using the church as a front or gimmick to make himself rich. Now, I want to read a few scriptures. And I want to give some insight into paying tithe because what I find to be quite interesting is people seem to pay more attention to Creflo Dollar saying that tithe is outdated than they did any other message that was preached in church. I also find it quite interesting that people have no problem paying the devil tithes. Yes, you pay the devil tithe whenever you buy your weave, Whenever you buy your, your weed, your drugs to get high, your alcohol, your cigarettes, you don't mind paying the money to go to clubs. You're going out partying. Fellas don't mind uh, paying money at the strip club. And even today, you have females that don't mind paying the devil's tithes at the strip club. But when it comes to the church, you have an issue with that. God does not want your money. He cares less if you pay tithe or not. He cares less if you even pay an offering. He doesn't care about your money. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. Not someone that's grudging and sparingly. If you're going to give to God, you give from your heart. And the people that complain the most about the church taking money or receiving tithe or offerings are usually the people that don't go to church and they're usually people that don't pay tithe or don't give an offering in church. And if they do, they always dig deep down in their pockets and pull up the change. I remember as a little boy, whenever we went to church, our parents would give us like maybe a dollar or some change to put in the offering plate. And we as children, we would go to the store. We don't put that money in the offering plate. We'll go to the store and spend it. A lot of times we kind of hung outside the church or at the store, but we got back in time enough, you know, to hear the remaining of the service and then when they're uh, dismissing from the church. But yet we usually don't put our money in the tithe as children. Unless, of course, you're sitting there right next to your parents 
right? But God don't care anything about your money. But I want to give a brief description or definition of tithe. What are tithe? Well, according to definition, it says one-tenth of annual produce or earnings. Now, mainly black people today have an issue with paying tithe. They like to always get religious on you and become a bootleg, a bootleg scholar telling you how that was done back in that day. And back in that day, they gave sheep and cattle and, 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 and a percentage of the profits they made for land. They didn't have currency back in that day. They're correcting that. But according to definition, it says one-tenth of annual produce or earnings formerly taken as a tax for the support of the church and clergy. So for those of you that have an issue with the pastor receiving a salary, well, the Bible says that a workman is worthy of his hire. If that pastor comes off his job and he's a full-time pastor, not saying that he have to always be in the church, but yet he's readily available because you may have a loved one or maybe even you yourself would end up in the hospital and you expect the pastor to get up out of his bed at night, leave his wife and his children and come and tend to you in, church, in, 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 in the hospital, praying for you, reading scriptures to you on your deathbed. When your children are out of control, there are so many, especially in the black community, that look for the pastor to come and get your sons out of jail. The pastor acts as an attorney. And you stand, and he stands, before the judge in favor or in defense of your child that you don't have control of. When you're hungry, and this may not be the case for every church, but when you're hungry, you have the food pantries, all of the things that the pastor, the clergy, offers to you when you have a loved one that dies and you want the church, you want your home church to bury your loved one. Or you get married. You call your pastor. Or you just need counseling, someone to talk to. You talk to your, your pastor because that's his full-time job. So a workman is worthy of his hire. Yes, he is a man of God. He preaches the word of God. But at the same time, that man also have a family or himself to feed. And that's how it was even back in the Old Testament. Because when the sacrifices were offered, or the, they had the burnt offering and the different type of offerings in the Old Testament, there was a portion of that that was to be given to the priest. The priest would eat that up, and whatever the priest didn't use up, it was destroyed. So, tithe or paying tithe has nothing in this modern time. It's according to your earnings, your wages. Now, there's another definition. It says the tithe is the 10% of his income to the church. Now, in Islam, and I mentioned this in a prior video, that in Islam, they pay zakat. Same thing as tithe, but in Islam, they pay 20% annually. So, get off this kick about how they pay tithe and livestock and, and cattle and all this other nonsense that you non-churchgoers 
like to use as an excuse to rob God. Now, I've never really heard too many pastors use guilt or fear tactics to receive tithe. Before they receive tithe and offering, there is a scripture that they use. Now, before I get to that scripture, I want to read a scripture taken from 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, reading the seventh verse, and it reads as follows. Every man according as he proposes in his heart. So when you give anything to the church, you give from your heart. You don't give according to necessity or grudgingly or sparingly. And to be honest, I really wouldn't want someone to give me anything and they feel pressured or obligated to give. I don't want that. But the Bible says, every man according as he proposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So if you're going to give to the church, God wants you to give cheerfully. He wants you to give willfully from your heart. Not feeling obligated. Not feeling under pressure. Not feeling guilty. And not being afraid. He don't want your money. He don't want your money if you are grudgingly and sparingly with it. And feeling that you are pressured. Or obligated to give it. When you give, you give from your heart. And when you give from your heart, God will reward you openly. And people would wonder why you are so blessed. Even in times that we're living in now. When we're dealing with lack and recession. you still working. Your home is still blessed. And those outside will call you blessed. You don't have to brag about what God has done for you. You don't have to walk around with a lot of jewelry around your neck and big fat rings and nice cars to show how God bless you. You don't have to do that. God will bless you openly where people outside will look at you as blessed. And that's because of the fact that you are a cheerful giver. You gave out of your heart. See, God is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. He does not change. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. Now, I'm going to read a scripture that the church usually reads before receiving tithe. And it's taken from the book of Malachi, the third chapter, reading the 10th verse. And it reads as follows. Now, this is God speaking. This is not the pastor. He may quote this scripture, but the scripture that he quotes, I don't believe that he's doing it to instill fear in you. He's just letting you know what thus saith the word. Now, according to Malachi, the third chapter, reading the 10th verse, it says, Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse. Why? That there may be meat in mine house. Now, what is that meat in my house? That meat is when the poor is hungry, you're able to feed the poor. If someone, a member is put outside their home, the church is able to help you. Not every church is able to do that. Because the people in that particular church does not pay tithe and give pennies when they give offerings. So when someone is in need, the church is lacking. They don't have to give. And I've been in churches where the pastor would give out of their own pockets. Someone that don't even go to the church will come to the church looking for help. 
It could be a mother, single parent moms, where there was a house fire and they have nowhere to go. And I know of this one pastor that he was in real estate, he owned property, and he put this girl and her kids in his apartment in one of his houses until she was able to get on her feet. The church helped that girl to get on her feet and she ended up joining that church. But not every church is able to do that because every church is not blessed where the people in that church will cheerfully receive or pay their tithe and offering. See, those small churches, those little small corner churches, a lot of them don't flourish, especially if a pastor is speaking the truth. See, people want someone to heed to their itching ears, tell them what they want to hear, and not what thus saith the Lord. Pastors that speak the truth, those are the ones that get ridiculed. Those are the ones you try to cancel because he spoke the truth. Most people nowadays do not want the truth. They want someone to lie to them. They want a way to escape. They don't mind paying the devil ties. But when they come to church, they feel they should hear a a gospel message to make them feel good and not give anything because that's the church. So the Bible says, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. See, so the Bible says, he asked the question, will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? Now, I'm going to pull that scripture up to you because I read to you the 10th verse. I'm going to, I'm going to start at the 8th verse again. Or better yet, I'm going to start at the seventh verse. It says, Even from the days of your fathers, ye have gone away from mine ordinance and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye say, Wherein shall we return? The eighth verse says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye saith, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? And then in the ninth verse it says, ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. And then it says, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now, herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I would not open you the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive. You ever go to these churches, especially these mega churches? Because one thing I can say for certain that a lot of these mega churches, they give money. That's why the pastor is able to live like they live, but yet when you look in that parking lot, you see a lot of people that make good money. They have good jobs. They have their own businesses. I remember when I started going to this one church, and every time I drove past this church, it seemed like everybody in that church had a brand new car. And they were mainly older people, and even the younger people were doing good. They either had really high-paying jobs or they had their own businesses, right? Right? And I used to wonder, like, why, how is it that these people, you know, are able to live like this? So I started visiting in this church, and I noticed that whenever they had offering time, when offering time came around, 
These people, they, the church would pass out the tithe envelopes to those who pay tithe. And people were like putting 10% of their earnings or their business or what they made in the envelope. The pastor never had to beg. He never had to beg and keep passing the offering plate because these people gave cheerfully. And when they was marching around uh, giving their tithe, first they received the tithe and then they have the general offering. People, they gave cheerfully. They had no problem putting their money in the offering. And as a result, a lot of these people, most of those people were blessed. That was a very rich church. The people were blessed as well. So it wasn't just the pastor driving a nice car, but you had the deacons, you had the members. They also had nice cars and homes and, and, uh, and businesses and good jobs because that money, that 10% that they gave out of their gross income, a lot of them didn't even miss it. It was just normal for them to do that. And when I started paying tithe, it seemed like things just started coming to me. Just came to me. My, I, got, I ended up getting in my own business and my business was, was flourishing. And, and again, people on the outside, they see you, they think you're rich. I wasn't rich, but I was just doing well. I was blessed. And when you're blessed like that, then you're able to help someone else. You understand? So, you know, yes, I know that scripture for a fact. You will be blessed when you give cheerfully. Not grudgingly, not sparingly, and not out of necessity. Like you feel you have to do it. But I want to read uh, one more final uh, chapter or part of a chapter. And this is showing a man and his wife that when the apostles, you know, told the members to sell their possessions and basically give to the church or whatever, you had this, this man and his, this wife uh, went and sold and they were grudgingly and they were sparingly. They, they sold their possessions, but they kept part for themselves and they lied to God. They lied to the Holy Spirit. It wasn't so much of the fact that they lied to the church or um, the apostles, but they lied to the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you what happened to these people that lied to the Holy Spirit. And it's taken from the book of Acts, the fifth chapter, reading the first to the ninth verse. And it reads as follows. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. While it remained, was it not thine own? In other words, it's yours. You don't have to lie, right? But they lied and they said, we sold all of it and this is all of it, but they were lying. They were given really grudgingly and sparingly. It says, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? So it was in your own power to give willfully. You could have kept that because God really don't want your money like that. If you're grudgingly and giving sparingly, God don't want your money. He don't need your money. God is rich in houses and land. He said, the camel of a thousand hills of mine. He said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't even tell you. He doesn't need your money. It says, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men but unto God. See, this is not preachers telling you this. So you may think it's a fear tactic, it's guilt, but this is not 
the man that's telling you this. He's only reading what's written. What's, what's, what's written in the word of God, that's what he's relaying to you. So God is speaking to you through that man. In the fifth verse it says, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. In other words, he died right there on the spot. And the Bible says, And great fear came on all of them that heard these things. Now, this is in the New Testament. You can't say, oh, that was the Old Testament back then. They were supposed to give sheep and cattle. They sold their possessions and came and laid them at the apostle's feet. And these people kept back a portion of it and then lied and said, this is all of it. And it says in the sixth verse, and the men arose, wound him up and carried him out and buried him. The seventh verse says, and it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. In other words, she agreed that she sold the land for a certain amount of money, and now she's given that certain amount of money to the church. But she was lying because she kept part of it. The eighth verse says, Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door. And shall carry thee out. Then the Bible talks about how she dropped dead on the spot. The 10th verse says, Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yield up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And then in the 11th verse it says, And great fear came on all the church and upon as many as heard these things. So this wasn't the man or the apostles that was initiating fear in people. It was the works of God by the actions of men and women. See, so it was in their own power to sell their land. They didn't have to give that if they didn't want to. It was their land and it was in their power to do what they wanted. But instead, they lied. And like he said, you're not lying to men, but you're lying to God. And another thing before I close out, the thing that people fail to look at is the fact that Peter knew what was in their heart by the Holy Spirit before she even walked in. He knew what was already in her heart. That's that spirit of discernment. Where the man of God, the one that was truly called and anointed by God, because every preacher has not been called by God. Every preacher is not anointed by God. Every preacher is not going to be saved. The Bible says you will know them by the fruit they bear. And you would also know them by the message that they preach without fear. And I want to give a shout out to Geno Jennings. Many religious groups give Geno Jennings the respect that they do because of the fact that Geno Jennings is not afraid of challenge. If someone wanted to challenge regarding the Bible, he would invite them into the pulpit. And he preaches boldly. And he don't run from any debate or challenge. And because of that, 
when the so-called Hebrew Israelites went and marched around his church and was creating havoc, you had other organizations like the Nation of Islam and even Hebrew Israelites came to his defense because what they did was wrong. And you had many people stand up in his defense because they knew what kind of person he was. He don't run from challenge. Most preachers that are not called by God run from challenge because even they themselves don't know the word of God. The only time many of them use the word is when they're trying to Jew you out of your money. And they will use the scriptures to do that. But see, you have to know the scriptures for yourself. You err by not knowing the scriptures, nor the power thereof. So, you have no problem paying the devil's tithe, but when it comes to paying tithe to the Most High or to the church, you have an issue with that. You rebel against that. But God doesn't want your money. If you're not giving it with a cheerful heart and willfully, he don't want that. You keep that in your pocket. Put that back in your pocket. And that's not saying you give to try to buy God because you can't buy God because he already knows in your heart why you giving. So even if you give to try to bribe God because you have people that's like that, they will try to buy their way into heaven. I gave to the church. I gave so many thousands of dollars to the church. I donated this to the church. And they'll brag about it. When you give out of a sincere heart, you give and you don't even need to mention it. People don't even need to know what you gave. Because it came from inside. And you don't have to brag about it because when you give cheerfully, not grudgingly, not sparingly, and God blesses you, people see that. What you do in the dark, God will make known in the open. So people will see you being blessed and they wonder why or how you're being blessed. Because you gave cheerfully and willfully, not grudgingly and not sparingly. So that's all I have to say about paying tithe. And I support paying tithe. And God, you know, and, and I'll say that Cruffalo Dollar, he was only speaking for himself. He wasn't speaking for the church. He wasn't speaking for the whole of the church. So maybe it was his tactic and his technique that he used fear and guilt to get people to give them, to give him money. And he got up and confessed it and now you got everybody talking about how all oh, these churches, these churches, this, come out of these churches and tithe is old fashioned, outdated. No, 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 no. And usually people that do that are people that's not in the church, don't go to church and don't give. Those are the ones that complain the most. But God honors a cheerful giver. So feedback, tell me what you think until next time. I'm fearless.